Um, <coughs> last time we discussed the compactification of the moduli space on a, uh, on a cylinder y times r, and just to recap that briefly, um, first thing, so here I've just indexed the moduli spaces between a pair of critical points by the dimension. Uh, I re should really keep track of the homotopy class of path between them, but sort of simplicity. Um, so if, if I look at a zero-dimensional moduli sp space between A and B, it's empty except if, sorry, <laughs> except if A equals B, then there's just a constant trajectory between them, okay? If there's a one-dimensional moduli space between A and B, then mod translation, I get a zero-dimensional set, finite set of points by compactness. The, uh, M, the two-dimensional moduli space mod translation, if I compactify it, uh, consists of, well, the top stratum is one-dimensional and is the two-dimensional moduli space mod the one-dimensional uh, action, the group of the group of translations, um, and then its boundary is all possible uh, <coughs> breaks that give you one-dimensional moduli spaces oops, uh, between them, and then mod up and by translation. Uh, for the three-dimensional moduli space, top stratum is this three-dimensional bit, then it can break into a one-dimensional and a two-dimensional bit on one side or in the opposite order, and then there's uh, a bit that's where it, there are two breaks. <coughs> so th this guy's two-dimensional, and uh, it, it looks a bit like this. That, so there's some, you know, looks a bit like a, a two-manifold with a corner, and these things look a bit like manifolds with corners as you go down. Then something interesting happens in this particular story in dimension eight. In dimension eight, um, well, we have the same the pieces that we've seen before, but then there's a new phenomenon, which is that a bubble can happen. And a bubble leaves behind, in this case, a moduli space of dimension. Um, it's an 800 number, which means they're probably telling me that my social security number has been compromised, and uh, you know I'm going to go to jail or something like that. Um, anyway. So we, it, 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 the, the next, so the new phenomenon that we're seeing is that there's this the potential for bubbling, but you notice that what it leaves behind is a zero-dimensional moduli space in this case. So this only, th there's only, a, there is a contribution here, but A has to be equal to B. And then th there'll be more bubble contributions as you go down, but this is the first one, All right? So, th so here, uh, A equals B. Okay, and, uh, and then I just want to recap why D squared is zero. The definition of D, the differential on our potential complex is that um, we count the number of trajectories in one dimensional moduli spaces from A to, to B, sum over B, and that, that's our answer. And you notice that <coughs> if I look at the matrix element from, uh, for D squared from A to B, then we're just summing over all C that are allowed breaks, and that's the boundary of this compactification of the boundary of the compactification of the um, two-dimensional uh, M2 mod translation being the boundary. Well, at least it's zero mod two. This is a one manifold. It has two ends, I mean pairs of ends, even number of ends. Okay, so that's so d squared is zero. So th this gives us our our complex, <coughs> um, and. N nice thing about, you know, you, as you learn about this stuff, you have two choices. You can read lots of books on homological algebra, or you can listen very carefully to the whispers that the moduli spaces are trying to tell you. The latter is a much more productive activity. Um, <coughs> so, let, so we can define maps uh, between these chain complexes by looking at moduli spaces on, well, instead of on a cylinder, let's put some interesting cobordism between them and, and form this manifold with cylindrical ends. We're gonna study instantons on here. Behavior's the same. The only failure of compactness is bubbling. 
<laughs> and then we can try and define a map which just counts. There's no longer a translation here, right? Because this is just some four manifold we can't translate. So the, a sensible thing to try to do is just count the number of solutions between a given A and B, and then let's try and define a map. The image of A is we look at all zero dimensional moduli spaces on this manifold, count the number of solutions that end up at B, multiply by B, and that, that's a map. And then <coughs> um, the observation is that's actually a, a, a chain map. Why? Because if I look at, look at instead a moduli space that's one dimension higher. So I look on this four manifold cylindrical end at a one dimensional moduli space. <coughs> um, what does what the compactification of this guy look like? Well, there's, there's only two interesting things that can lead to non-compactness. The dimension's too low for bubbling, right? So there's only two interesting phenomena. Some energy can slide out to the right. Your right, my right, depends. So that's somebody's right. Um, anyway, left. Or it can slide out <laughs> to the right. That's stage. Stage left, stage right? Yeah, I don't know. I never remember which stage left, stage right is yours or mine. Um, anyway, uh, so if it slides out, um, dimension counting tells you that the only thing that can happen is that it can slide. This is one dimensional, so the dimensions add up. So it, either one dimension goes out that way, leaves zero here, or one goes out that way, leaves zero here. So you get this kind of a, so the, the compactification of this one dimensional moduli space is the moduli space mod translation sliding out that way, union zero dimensional moduli space here, and the opposite. And <coughs> if you interpret this in terms of that map, it's just saying it's a chain map. Right, and then, um, well, of course, you, n now you should appreciate that we've made many choices um, in the construction, and we should check that these things are independent of the choices that we make, and then you can, you can convince yourself um, that if you now look at, um, you know, you can look at moduli space, kind of parameterized moduli spaces and come up between chain homotopies between these things, et cetera. So the, just kind of staring at the moduli spaces gives you a lot of nice stuff. Okay, uh, eraser, great. All right, so we <coughs> we've basically got a floor homology group, group for a three manifold. So we have, uh, you know, we'd like to say uh, it's the the floor homology is just the homology of this chain complex. There's a, a, a bit of a, a lie, so there, because th there might be reducible connections, reducible flat connections. So those are, those are where the, you know, the stabilizer of A is not, well, the center of the gauge group. Um, <coughs> let's think about SU2. Sorry, uh, not equal to the center. Um, centers, uh, centers just plus or minus the identity in this case. Um, it, if we have reducibles, then that kind of, if you think carefully through the story, it, it wreaks some havoc. Um, but there's a nice trick that we can do to avoid reducibles. Alternatively, we can work much harder. Um, now, the, the trick is, r remember, uh, we observed that on the two torus, um, this is no, this T2 and, and P, um, <coughs> there's a unique irreducible flat connection um, you know, with uh, SU2 connection up to conjugacy with holonomy, uh, <coughs> um, uh, holonomy conjugate to, to I. Around the, around the point P. So we discussed that last time. Now, that's not quite a three manifold, but, uh, <coughs> yeah, sorry. I did this a little, little bit out of order. Um, so let's look at 
So this is the three sphere. That's the hop flank. There's this blue point. Uh, <coughs> let's consider, look at the hop flank in the three sphere. Um, <coughs> the, if you think of the, the complement of the hop flank uh, retracts onto uh, the torus that links either of these guys, that sits around either of these guys. So um, the <coughs> I can think of uh, S3 with the hop flank and this, uh, this blue curve being my, my second Stiefel Whitney class is giving us uh, you know, different three manifold, I mean a three manifold whose representation spaces are identified with the representation space of the torus. So this guy has a unique irreducible flat connection. So this S3H and this uh, omega, this has a, has a unique irreducible flat connection, flat SU2 connection up to conjugacy. <coughs> so um, we're going to connect some with this guy. So we take um, so let's call this <coughs> y sharp. So that's just the connect sum of our three manifold with this th three sphere and the hop link, hop flink in this uh, curve omega. Now this has <coughs> all the all representations are irreducible, right? Because since it's irreducible over here, well, this guy th doesn't have any stabilizer, so whatever it has over here, the whole thing can't have a stabilizer. So that's great. But now we've run into a slight problem. <coughs> we have this hot flank, and actually the holonomy, well, by construction, some other chalk. <coughs> um, sorry. Did I say, I said, sorry, the hol holonomy around here is minus the identity. <coughs> <All right. coughs> so holonomy around here is minus the identity, but the holonomy around here is, is conjugate to, to the quaternion I. As a, I mean, that's the holonomy on one of these loops, right? The, the, remember, this representation had holonomy, say, I around this loop and J around this loop. So it'll have holonomy I around this guy, J around this, this guy. Those are, remember, conjugate, but um, OK. So uh, this is not quite the story we have. This is now a three manifold that has a knot in it. OK, well, that's maybe we should just figure out how to do that. Then we can do knot theory, too. So. <coughs> um, or be folding. So um, it turns out that a, a lot of the story for, inst for instanton floor homology, et cetera, it, it works just as well for orbifolds, not just ordinary manifolds. And, and so let's make our, but let's think about the sim simplest possible kind of orbifold that we could get. <coughs> you know, so if we have a three manifold with a knot, I'm going to construct an orbifold, and it's going to be the, the kind of absolutely simplest orbifold. Um, namely, you know, there's my knot. Let's make the knot have a color. It's sitting innocently in the three manifold, and I'm, what I'm going to decide to do is. Um, is think of constructing a, a manifold that has uh, a cone angle of pi along the knot. So kind of change the picture to think of it like this. And here 
Um, so, in, in other words, um, I think, uh, you know, to say another way, I could, I remove the tubular neighborhood of the knot, then I divide by a pi rotation to make an orbifold, and then I stick in the tubular neighborhood again. That's just made the kind of, you know, the, uh, the normal disk half as big. It's still a disk. The neighborhood, its boundary is still a torus. I can stick it back in. Um, and we get, you know, so that's the construction of the orbifold. And we can sort of, you know, at this level of detail, we just repeat the construction of, uh, of, of the instanton complex. <coughs> um, and, uh, well, so w w th there's one um, modification that happens. So the, the main change don't get something for nothing. Um, so, by the way, it, <coughs> um, when I, when I ha when I put in this orbifold structure, I, I, I want to really exp exploit the fact that I have a knot and remember it in the definition. So, the way I'm going to do that is is via what kind of connections I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at connections that are that are sort of genuinely interesting orbifold connections. So they should have non-trivial holonomy around this loop. So if, if I have a, a, an orbifold, um, it's natural to think of its fundamental group as, you know, if, if I take a, a little loop that links the orbifold locus, well, going once around that loop should be an interesting curve. But in, in this case, if I go twice around it, that should be null homotopic, right? That, and, you know, that, that obviously generalizes to higher, or, higher order kind of orbifolds. So <laughs> I want the uh, holonomy in the color yeah, it's green so we're going to require the linking holonomy to be uh, of order exactly 2 so it's not trivial. It has to be order two. Now, if now, here's a little. Uh, this guy, I of course, has order four in SU two. So the way I'm going to think about this is really as a, as I'm going to think of it as an SO three bundle away from this locus. I descends to an element of order two in SO three. So I, it's fair to think about. Uh, this kind of connection, you know, so I take my hop link in the story, construct an orbifold along the hop link, um, you know, look at interesting connections, think of, uh, you know, interesting SO3 connections, but I'm only going to divide out by a kind of SU2 gauge group. Anyway, um, yeah, so just sort of, for the moment, believe that when you do this orbifold thing, you can construct an instanton floor homology so that amongst the flat, if you computed the flat connections here, you just get the ones that we're looking at. Um, the main difference in, in the, sorry. Yes? No, if I, if I take, if I take, uh, um, yeah. 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 So that, what I mean is that the limiting holonomy should be um, should be non-trivial. I mean, I, you know, just to say it, that is, I I'm going to look at orbifold connections where in the orbifold chart, you know, the, an orbifold connection means that when I lift the orbifold chart, it's an honest connection, but it's invariant under the symmetry group, and I want the action on the bundle to be a particular non-trivial order to action. And the connection has to respect that. 
which in kind of geometric terms passing down means that the holonomy as I link the loop, uh, you know, shrink, have shrinking loops linking the thing, they have this uh, order two holonomy. Okay, so the ma main difference is, is what the compactification looks like. <coughs> um, and now what can happen, well, so if I look at uh, four manifold, I, I can do the same construction with a four manifold and a surface. At that, and uh, now there's two kinds of bubbling phenomena. You can bubble uh, here at a point interior, and the dimension drops by eight. And it, this story happens to be set up that, you know, so this has drop of eight. Now you can also bubble uh, at a point on the surface, and this has a, a dimension drop of four, turns out. Um, so the compactification's a little, you know, now it's a little more complicated. You need to keep track of bubbles uh, on the, on the four-manifold bubbles on the surface. But <coughs> the dimension drop is four, and that's still, if you go back and think about that compactification story that we looked at, the interesting thing, the interesting new thing that starts to happen when you try and look at the issue of defining d squared happens in the four-dimensional moduli spaces between pairs of trajectories because you could have a, a, a bubble that leave, leaves behind a, a trajectory between two equal connections, but only once it's four-dimensional. So, um, so, you know, we can still get uh, get uh, a differential uh, on C star of Y K um, and D squared is zero. So, um, so we can define, so now that's great. Now, at least it makes sense, you know, if I do this procedure, now Using that definition, um, this instanton floor homology makes sense for any three manifold, as long as I do this connect sum. And more generally, it makes sense for knots in three manifolds. Um, yes? Is there a good model for the uh, bubble on the Oh, yeah. The, the model is, so, sorry, I should have said that. I mean, the, it, if you look at instantons on R4, you could look at the instantons that are invariant under Z2 action that fixes a two plane and is minus one on the orthogonal two plane. Now, if you, th you remember that, <coughs> so, you know, the standard instanton is, of course, invariant under that. But the only c conformal transformations which are invariant under that are conformal transformations of the fixed R2. So the moduli space <coughs> becomes, in instead of, SO51 mod SO5, it becomes SO21 mod, um, <coughs> um, mod uh, SO, sorry, SO31 uh, mod uh, SO3, a hyperbolic, um, sorry, yeah, sorry, what, a, yeah, sorry, SO21 mod SO2, yeah hyperbolic two space. And um, the, so, <coughs> um, the, yeah. You should think of the frame, frame moduli space. Anyway, I, I don't want to <coughs> say more about that. Just, I mean, I can say more about that later, but I want to kind of get through this story. No, no, you have to perturb. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're not talking about perturbations because there's not enough time, but everything has, you know, you have to perturb the equations to get everything to be more smale. Uh, alternatively, well, of course, you could do more spot if you wanted, but think of doing more smale. So there's some hidden perturbations that uh, are swept under the rug. <laughs> anyway, so we get, uh, uh, 
this, yeah, so the compactification is a little more delicate, but there's still uh, still a differential d squared is zero, and um, <coughs> um, yeah, great. And so the, so more generally, we get uh, an instanton floor homology for uh, three manifold and a knot, and you know the. I, I, just to draw that picture again, and that, so here's why. Maybe there's some interesting knot in it. Um, and there's the hop flank over here. S3 over here. Connect some. Right. <coughs> um, that, you know, um, we have to be a tiny, so, but also the uh, cobordism story works. Now you can have a cobordism of pairs. You have a knot in a three manifold, and there's a surface in a four manifold, which is com comes out another knot in another three manifold. Um, you have to keep track of this bit of data, so you need to take a, drag a base point from one three manifold through uh, to the other side. But there's so we get this invariant, lovely. Okay. Um, we got functoriality, great. All right, so <coughs> I want to sketch for you um, <coughs> uh, important property. So um, So this, this floor homology group, um, you know, it's like any homology group, it turns out that there are exact triangles that help you compute it. And I want to kind of sketch the story for the exact triangle for knots. There's actually an exact triangle with just for three manifolds, which involves surgery on the three manifold. But I'm going to describe <coughs> uh, the exact triangle for knots. So the exact triangle. Um, involves these three knots. So it, I, I imagine there's some knot in the three manifold. And I'm, it, I see inside some three ball this picture. And I re replace it by these two pictures. OK. <coughs> um, and let's call this knot k0, k1, k, sorry, k2, k1, k0. Um, <laughs> and so, of course, you, you remember from uh, Jake's lecture that this looks like the Havanov picture, but the crossing is different. So that's a Um, that's no, it's, I'll, I'll explain more. <coughs> um, I mean, sorry, the, you know. <coughs> um, so if I have a planar projection, then you know, then there's a difference between an, this crossing. I mean, you know, if, if I turn the picture, everything turns. Right? <laughs> okay, look, what did you see from the back of the board? <laughs> uh, you see the same picture, actually. Um, so, I mean, l let, me, let me put this in a little bit more <laughs> yeah, now, just bear with me for one moment. Sorry. <coughs> Why are there three anyway? Jesus Christ. Sorry, let me. I should have. Okay, let me.
So these are three tetrahedra, and um, let's say, sorry, I got it. <coughs> I have to get the convention right. Um, Sorry, tiny bit hopeless. I didn't think about that. Sorry, I don't want to do that one. I just did that one. Um, let's do this one. And what's left? These opposite edges, that opposite edge, and what's remaining. <coughs> so the tet these tetrahedra, um, why did I draw that one differently? Sorry. Anyway, um, <coughs> the tetrahedra has three pairs of opposite edges. The, uh, the, the really important thing is how I'm going to go between these guys. OK? So in the Havanov story, you know, it's just algebra, you pick some convention, you just got to make sure you stick with it somehow, and life is OK. Um, <coughs> in this story, we need some geometry. We need a cobordism to define a map. And what the cobordism is, <coughs> if I want to go from here to here, well, there's, a natural <coughs> there's a natural cobordism. Now, what it does, um, uh, yeah. So, you know, I start um, so yeah, you know, I take this edge to kind of describe it. So the, this is actually going to be a cobordism in four space. I'm going to describe its projection into three space. I take this edge and I start rotating it till it meets um, you know, take this red edge, rotate it so that it stays on, the, the ends stay on the tetrahedron until it gets uh, to here. And then the boundary includes this bit, which is this blue curve. All right, so that, that gives me uh, a cobordism from here to here. Um, then there's similar cobordisms uh, that go, uh, you know, so maybe that's sigma 2, 1, sigma 1, 0. Sigma zero two, um, and um, you know, 